Thomas Logan has been the chair of the Alachua County Children's Service Advisory Board since August of 2016. He is also the vice chair of the Suwannee Valley Four C's Head Start Board. He received a PhD in early childhood education from the University of Florida in 1990. He has taught in and managed early learning and care programs in several states since 1973, principally in the National Head Start program, but most recently as executive director of the Early Learning Coalition of Florida's Gateway, administering the School Readiness and Voluntary Pre-Kindergarten, or VPK, programs of Columbia, Hamilton, Lafayette, Suwannee, and Union Counties. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate your inviting me. You know, the CSAB, Children's Services Advisory Board, is near and dear uh, to the County Commission. And uh, can you, for the folks who are not familiar with it, can you just kind of talk a little bit about the genesis of this and how this came to be and how the County Commission came to fund this effort? Yeah, uh, it, it began, uh, well, number one, the resolution that created the CSAB uh, was passed in 2016 in the summer, so about two years ago. But it went back several years before that as uh, advocates for early childhood in the county uh, wanted to bring more focus uh, from the County Commission and from uh, the taxpayers, actually, th the whole range of people who might be involved on the issues that impact children from birth to age five. And so they began to talk to the County Commission some years ago about establishing a, well, I think it, em it, it evolved as it went along. There are several counties around the state that have Children's Services Advisory Councils. Now, they in, they uh, exist independently of county commissions. They have their own sources of tax funding, and we might talk about this again later. Sure, we'll get to that. But, but rather than start right there, the county commission decided that they would create uh, a board within the county commission, provide it with some additional funds, and then uh, and, and spent a lot of time dialoguing with the uh, advocates for early childhood that they'd been talking to them about the Children's Services Council for a while. And the initial funding, I believe, was $1.2 million. It was $1.2 million. Dollars, and it right. would be, it be uh, in the fiscal year in which we were at that time, uh, which was fiscal year, the, well, the next fiscal year began in October 1 of 2017. And right. so uh, the way fiscal years roll over or don't roll over is, is uh, is mysterious, as you work in the <laughs> county may know, but uh, I understand it, but I'm not allowed to tell you. That's it right. Works. It's it's a mystery. <laughs> but the 1.2 million was a commitment from the county commission, and even though early uh, children's services councils can uh, work with children up the age of 18, by st it's a it's a statutory body, by the way, a children's services council like a library board. Sure. Uh, and if you have one, you can th that. Children's Services Council can choose to serve just younger children, children up to a certain age, children all the way to age 18. But our board decided it was that zero to five. And, for and this there was funding. a reason for that. Right. Uh, the advocates over the years had had made it clear to county commissioners that the crucial years for getting children ready for success in life, uh, it, you know, kindergarten initially, but in general success in life that begins in kindergarten were those early years. And it wasn't that the other years weren't important and that uh, there couldn't be, uh, it couldn't benefit from assistance from the county, but they thought if we really wanted more return on investment, more bang for the buck, if you will, that the county would be best advised to put its resources at the early level, zero to five. Sticking with the history of this a little bit, um, you know, it's the board <coughs> is really made up of a who's who of people that are uh, experts in the field and, you know, people who are very passionate about this subject, including and yourself. And willing to spend a lot of time. A lot of time. Yeah. You guys meet a lot. Yeah. Um, can you tell us who's on the board with you? Sure. The Children's Services Council, the, the statewide group, has a, uh, their membership is statutory. But when the county commission created this advisory board, they kind of used that as a model, but they didn't stick to it uh, uh, entirely as it was with the state. So there are what we might call ex officio members. There are members, uh, there is, uh, for example, Karen Clark, the school board superintendent, is, is on our board and at the state level would be, that superintendent would also be. They would like, they, they saw the benefit of having someone from the uh, Department of Health 
And so uh, Diana Duque, who works with the Department of Health and uh, works with families and especially is interested in nutrition programs. Right, she's involved in the WIC program. She is indeed. She so started the, the, the little farmer's market out at the health department mm -hmm. and, and she's really interested in working with families and so she was brought on the board. Uh, the Department of Children and Family, well, that's an interesting one because uh, the Department of Children and Families at the state level is statutorily uh, required. So we have Cheryl Twombly who works with uh, the circuit three and eight uh, of, of the Department of Children and Families and she works in, in community development programs for them. So she's our actual member, but then in addition, uh, uh, Esther Tibbs, who I think everybody's familiar with, who was with DCF for many years, uh, uh, volunteered to be considered and the Board of County Commissioners thought that was an appropriate uh, uh, because upon retirement Esther has stayed in the business of advocacy for children Absolutely. consistently and so yeah. she was a great uh, additional member and also I think they wanted to spread it around the community and so they went to the University of Florida and actually uh, there are two members uh, who represent the University of Florida in, in different ways uh, uh, there is Pat Snyder, Dr. Pat Snyder, who is the director, a uh, co-director of the Anita Zucker Center at the University of Florida College of Education, which is a, uh, a, a endowed department from a philanthropist, Anita Zucker, uh, that is really focused on early childhood issues. And Such an amazing resource. They've become have. a worldwide, yeah. worldwide known, and in fact, our problem is getting Pat at the table because she's often in New Zealand, or I don't want to exaggerate, she, but she travels a lot, and for good reason, she's an expert. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, Nancy Hart, who was on the College of uh, Medicine faculty for years and uh, was uh, a uh, emeritus professor there, then retired, and she has committed her volunteer time also as an advocate for young children. And Dr. Hart is a frequent visitor oh, to the county commission yeah. and they rely on her for so much. Yeah, and, and she kind of created the way we looked at poverty in Alachua County years ago uh, with, with gathering data in a novel fashion. And I think a, a lot of what she did relates to what went on out at the swag communities in uh, Southwest mm -hmm. Gainesville. And so, yeah, and so she was added on. In addition, uh, we, we wanted the involvement of the private sector. And so uh, Andy, Girard, who, uh, Andy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> Andy uh, Sherrard, who right. is on, uh, who is the, one of the founding uh, founders of O to B Kids right. and uh, one of the directors of O to B Kids was brought on for his expertise as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were looking for mental health expertise. And so Elizabeth Patton, who now works at Queen of Peace School actually, but has extensive experience in working uh, with young children and is a licensed mental health professional. We brought her on also as an expert in mental health for young children. Uh, and let's see, who haven't, uh, what regions haven't I covered? Uh, I'm thinking that, hmm. Uh, it's, it's okay to look at your notes. You don't yeah. want to leave anyone out. <laughs> I, well, oh, and, and this, this may seem, uh, 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 this is critically important, and it's also statutorily required is that the judicial circuit, which matches the DCF circuit, uh, it also needs to be involved because issues with young children and young families at times, unfortunately, end up in the, in the judicial system. And uh, Nancy Wilkoff, who is a magistrate with uh, Circuit 8, right. uh, she has worked with families uh, in, in her, uh, as a, with the courts, uh, often with children's issues and, and that family uh, retention and those kinds of issues and so uh, she also was added to the board and she was in fact appointed by uh, uh, Circuit 8 to represent that circuit on the board because of her expertise in working with children and families. So yeah I think we tried to cover every area that that seemed in an ex officio manner. In other words, if you're gonna set something up that address the issues of children, don't you want the school board? Don't you want DCF? Don't sure. you want the Department of Health? Uh, don't you want someone from the judicial system? Uh, and at the same time, we tried to put people in who had the backgrounds, uh, uh, especially focused on early learning programs. And thus, we went to University of Florida, we went to the private sector, right. Uh, we went to mental health a mental health professional who would work with young children, and my background isn't really entirely in working with programs that serve young kids. And so I think the county commission had a had, they had two things in mind. One was to set up a board that looked 
a lot like what the Children's Services Council might look like, but at the same time to focus on that zero to five level and load up that board with people with zero to five expertise. It is without a doubt an all-star lineup on oh, that board. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the zero to five emphasis of this program, the more I delve into this, the more I learn about it, the more I realize that the science is in, yeah. that you can almost take a five-year-old and evaluate his or her development and emotional development and intellectual development and predict whether that child is going to be successful ultimately. Um, yeah. so, so our board narrowed the focus mm -hmm. to that and then what was the charge? What, was the, what were well, the initial marching orders? There, well, there were several, but there was one what I think is the main one. Uh, number one, we were uh, asked to do or, or to oversee a needs assessment just to, to get some data, some current data, and, and we did uh, issue a uh, contract to Well Florida, and they did a needs assessment to gather data on the zero to five population. That was part of the charge. Part of the charge also, relates to what we've been talking about at Children's Services Council. The Board uh, of County Commissioners wanted to know uh, if we get a group of local experts together and they look at the situation, would they recommend that we create a Children's Services Council here in Alachua County? And I might add just briefly, this has gone before, a Children's Services Council has gone before the, the voters in Alachua County in the past and wasn't approved, but they thought the time had come now, and as you point out, it's it's undeniable now what we know about children zero to five in terms of what they need that will make them successes uh, in our in our economy and and just in general in life uh, that th they thought the time was ripe now to bring this back to the uh, people of Alachua County but they wanted us to weigh in on that right. and so that was another one of our charges was to uh, uh, let them know if we thought that was an appropriate way for Alachua County to go in the future. And so, but the main charge was to, I, the, way I, uh, the way I read it and the way the board agreed in reading it was that they wanted us to create something new. And they didn't say we shouldn't fund existing programs that serve children zero to five. Because for example, we do fund the Early Learning Coalition with, with some money t to match their state funds. Right. So we, we still do that with some of the county's dollars. That's historically been uh, uh, something the county has done. But what, uh, what, what they wanted us to do that was new was to go beyond existing programs and see if we couldn't create a coordinated system that was new to Alachua County that would address things in a more systematic fashion. Perfect segue into <laughs> the really great programs that have started to appear now. Uh, can you tell us about the home visit, nurse yeah. visit program? The newborn uh, home visit program, yeah. yeah. The, when we looked at programs that would serve zero to five, oddly enough, we started out at zero. Uh, and we, there were precedents around the state for programs where county Children's Services Councils generally, but county uh, um, boards of county commissioners as well, had funded a home visit by a registered nurse from a hospital where births took place uh, in that county. And we, we did a lot of, of research on the topic and we thought if we're gonna start in looking at the needs of children zero to five in Alachua County, shouldn't we first look at the health and welfare and, and home life of the children who go home from our hospitals uh, and continue to live in Alachua County. <clears throat> and, and, and recall, these are Alachua County dollars, they're taxpayers' dollar, and so we only serve families who reside in Alachua County. And of course, some of the families who have their children in our local hospitals might go elsewhere, but we've restricted our service here. But what we ended up with was a voluntary program, of course, but a program without any, any uh, barriers to the service. And we, we didn't ask people their income, we didn't ask about uh, if the children were special needs or any issues like that. We just asked every single mother of a newborn if she would like a home visit within the first week of her going home with the baby. And this is North Florida as well as Shams? And, right? and nurse midwives as well. Okay. Not even restricted to hospital births. But and who is administering the program? This is, is it being administered also by Well Florida's a ha a Healthy Start uh, branch. Right. And so that grant went to uh, Well Florida and Healthy Start, and then they worked out collaborative agreements with both of the major hospitals as well as with the midwives. 
What does the nurse do when they go into the home? Well, they basically are, are willing to assess the health of the mother and assess the health of the baby, and if you will, assess the health of the home in terms of safety and, and the availability of what children might need at that age. But again, it's entirely voluntary, and, and uh, though I think my last look at the, at the numbers indicates that something like 60% of, they've, there's been about uh, more than 100 of these uh, visits, and I think somewhat in the range of 60% of those to whom this has been introduced have accepted a home visit, which by the standards of the programs in other counties is kind of low. They get a 90% acceptance rate, but it's a new program. Right. So it's voluntary. And, and when they get to the home, it's really up to the families. Uh, they, uh, the, it's a registered nurse. She's able to and willing to do a complete physical of the mother. If the mother thinks there might be some issues that worry her, uh, they're able to do a complete physical of the baby. They're able to give the mother nursing advice, uh, breastfeeding advice. They're able to give the mother any, uh, uh, anything she might think she has questions about in terms of the safety and appropriateness of what's in the home of what she's doing with the baby. Uh, the nurses are there to answer those questions, and we're not going to provide medical services per se. Uh, it's going to be if, if the uh, examinations, uh, if the, uh, the questions of the parents lead us to the point where we think, well, you know, I, you might want to get a referral here uh, to you know, ease your mind on that issue, that nurse visitor will help the family get a referral. So the nurse is well versed in all the yes. different social medical different services well, well, that are available? And in fact, uh, uh, there's been some question. We, we, you, we didn't really begin to provide services in any of our programs until this year. So you might think, well, we were in existence for over a year before that. But uh, these were done with great care. And, the, and, mm -hmm. and we knew from day one, we did not want in a nurse home visit program anyone visiting the home who wasn't well versed in what that home visit should look like and what it should be like. Right. Because this is going to be an important uh, event for that new mom and, and new family. And so uh, there's extensive training that went on way before these folks went out there. Now we got uh, people at two home care agencies, the Shands Home Care Agency and what's called Nurse Corps who works with North Florida. And they chose people to work in this field who had that background and that interest and then we did extensive training. Can you describe the pilot of the Transformative Professional Development for Early Care and Education Don't programs? you love it? Uh, uh, <laughs> Rolls right off the tongue. Well, we, we, we've, <laughs> we've reduced it uh, to Transformative Professional Development. And TPD. Fact, TPD. We've reduced it to TPD. But transformative is an important concept. Um, that first program may seem obvious to everybody. Uh, you know, what a great idea. Families often, moms go home often fewer than 24 hours and they got all kinds of questions. So that makes sense. The next two, and this is the first one we're gonna talk about, and it's been existence in, uh, we funded this one uh, uh, in, I think in the spring. And, but the point of this one is in fact to, as a, at least in a pilot way this year, to transform the way uh, early childhood professionals, and what, and by that I mean uh, uh, the people who work in child care centers and preschools around the entire county. Now we're not going to transform. By transform, we simply mean that, uh, given what we know now about the way children development, there's a lot of st of, of the ways we might work with children that probably uh, uh, need to be refined throughout the county. And, and the Anita Zucker Center jumped in on this one, and we're not funding them. This is all pro bono from the University of Florida. They're gonna provide that training. In fact, they've actually put a person on staff uh, who will be a, a PhD in early childhood who will be working full time with this program. And what they decided, uh, what uh, uh, they recommended and what our body, our, our advisory board decided was we needed a demonstration site. And so we have, not entirely our dollars, but we contributed to the development of a demonstration site in the SWAG community. I think many people in Alachua County be familiar with the SWAG community. SWAG, Southwest Advocacy Group. Right, and, and it serves a, a low-income community right off of 20th Avenue uh, out uh, between the interstate and Hale Plantation. Right off Tower Road. Yes, oh. and, and, and they've, they have over the years managed to get a multi-purpose center uh, built out there. They've managed to get a branch of the health department built out there, but what they lacked 
And what that community had always lacked was quality child care. But, but we decided to, to join with the SWAG group because, uh, and with the University of Florida because we saw this as an opportunity not just to provide a child care center for the SWAG community, but to make that child care center a model for the entire community. And so that's what transformative professional development means. It means that the Zucker Center will, will create a model of training and technical assistance for, for child care professionals there at the center in the SWAG community. It's called the Child Center, and I would have to uh, have one of the two Dorothys here to tell me what C-H-I-L-D <laughs> all stand for. Maybe you know. Uh, no, but I know the two Dorothys, yes. forces of nature that they are. Yeah. So the Child Center, uh, and, and actually, uh, not, you know, it's not a job. The, the letters stand for a very appropriate way of looking at early learning. And so right. the Child Center is designed to be uh, not, just, not just a child care center, but a model center that will provide training and technical assistance, first to the staff that works there, and then by having staff come in from other centers around the county uh, and, and learn uh, the most innovative ways of working with children. So ultimately the, the goal here is to create a model that can be duplicated in other Absolutely. daycare, childcare Absolutely. centers. And it might look different from place to place as, as one would expect, but, uh, but the Zucker Center has developed over the years and, it's, and, and they've done it elsewhere in the country, a model for uh, helping child care uh, professionals to become uh, better at what they do and to serve the interests of children better. So, uh, and, and they'll, we'll, they'll create our local model at the Child Center in the SWAG community and we've helped the funding and that center in fact is built and ready to open, if I'm not mistaken, later this month uh, along with the public schools and begin to serve children there. But as it opens to serve children, it'll also open as a place where a, uh, it will become a teaching center as well as a place that serves young children. Um, we're on the, the next pilot now. It and also it, has a, a name that flows right off the tongue. Absolutely. The Healthy Social and Emotional Development and Family Support Program, or SED. Is SED is good. Yeah. Said. Well, yeah, <laughs> SED. We'll call it SED. But, okay. uh, but that is social emotional development. And that's right. the, that is, again, is the key. I mean, transformative is the key in the last one. Social emotional is the key in this one. There, this uh, grant will work with uh, the transformative professional development by uh, providing uh, transformative professional development, if you would, in a different realm, which is. Uh, social emotional development. We avoided the term of mental health because we didn't want it to be seen as going into centers and identifying children whose behavior is such that they need a special uh, uh, level of assistance and, and therapy perhaps. It's a, it's a model of prevention and it's going to work in coordination with transformative professional development. Again, working with probably the same centers that work with transformative uh, uh, professional development and adding another layer of training and technical assistance, but this time very specifically in the area of uh, child behavior. And because entering kindergarten knowing your ABCs and one, two, threes is one thing. Entering, entering kindergarten with the social and emotional skills that allow you to, to participate effectively, that's another thing. And that's really a very special area. And so we, what, what came from that one was the county funding, actually the Meridian Mental Health Operation, and they're going to place two licensed professional mental health counselors in the field based in, again, some of the child care centers that have agreed to work with us along with the, with the SWAG Child Center. And that group, and so it was something that the Zucker Center really wanted to be added to what they were doing also. They thought, this is a special area and you need mental health professionals, but we don't want to see it as providing therapy to children or therapy to families even. What we want to see it as is helping child care providers know how to set up their classroom, know how to work with children, and, and thus make it a better uh, experience for everybody. These are really incredible programs. And, you know, you talked early on about we could have gone one of two ways, Children's Services Advisory Board, County Commission funded, or the uh, Children's Trust. Um, and I know that the board, in talking to the experts, were convinced that a Children's Trust should be placed on the ballot. 
Mm -hmm. Coming up on November 6th, citizens will have the uh, choice of voting yes or no for a children's trust. If it is successful, uh, it will have its own board, and mm -hmm. you've already talked about the makeup of that board. It will have its own funding source up to, I believe it's, is it a half a mil? Half a mil, yes. Uh, that would be levied on property. Um, so tell us about your, kind of in our last couple of minutes here, about the relationship about, uh, of the two entities and how you're feeling about it. Well, uh, uh, the Children's Trust, which is actually uh, our name for a Children's Services, advi or a Children's Services Advisory Council, a Children's Services Council, excuse me, uh, which is modeled across the state. There's, there's uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 of them already. It will be most different in that it will not draw from county commission funds at all. It will be a taxing district, as I said, similar to a library board. It can tax up to uh, half a mil. That would produce, we're told, between six and seven million dollars a year. As you noted before, we're right now running on 1.2 million dollars. So it will increase the dollars, but it will also increase the mission because Children's Services Councils generally and our Children's Trust would be then committed to serving children all the way up to the age of 18 and not just zero to five. So it would, it would broaden the mission. Uh, it would, uh, and, and we would, we would work with them in a trend, if, if it were to pass, and, and I think most people in the county are hopeful it will, that we will work with them in the transition this coming spring, because if it passes, the governor has to appoint a board by the first of the year, January or February, and that board has to be working on a budget and a plan by the spring, and we will work then with the Children's Trust to make that transition, and we hope continue these programs that we've already uh, initiated here in the county. Well, Tom, thank you so much for, for coming on. This is fascinating stuff, and it's, uh, it's just crucial, the health oh, of is. our children and the well-being of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. There's nothing more important than knowing your child is safe and happy. So choosing the perfect child care setting is a big decision. Quality child care offers healthy, social, and educational experiences in a nurturing and stimulating environment, catering to your child's individual needs. But with so many options, how do you know what to look for and what questions to ask? We are here to help. Please visit myflfamilies.com slash childcare to learn how to find the best place for your child. The agent told us we'd be more comfortable somewhere else. We filed a complaint with HUD. Now we're living in the home of our choice. Suspect you've been discriminated against because of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, or disability? Report it. Fair housing is your right. Use it. She was, seemed really depressed. She seemed so isolated. She said she was never born. And... So I knew he had depression, but I didn't know it was that far. He said something to me about uh, killing himself. I didn't know what to do because I kind of thought, oh, he's going to be mad at me. Tell somebody, tell an adult, a counselor, parent, whatever. It would have been horrible for me if she never talked to me again. But I'd live with it because I know she'd be alive. Definitely worth getting help, even if you think you're going to lose a friendship, because it's better to lose the friendship than the actual friend.